Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to CCAP. Uh, my name is Peter Harianto, and I'm the president of this club. And if you don't know, uh, CCAP is the Structural Engineering Club on campus. Um, we specialize at getting um, structural engineers professionals that uh, will come to talk, about, talk to us about um, just what they do in the industry, and um, that allows us to connect and network with um, yeah, structural professionals. All right. Um, this year, uh, membership is free, as you guys know, and uh, with our membership, all you have to do is sign in to sign in sheet, which should be coming in the chat uh, real soon. And what this does is it makes you eligible for our t shirt raffle that, um, yeah, if you attend and sign in, uh, you'll be put in t shirt raffle and receive a free t shirt if you win it. And it also gives you uh, eligibility for our tech tours and socials. Uh, which means uh, that, yeah, you'll be put into a group chat where you'll be able to know about everything that we do. Uh, most recently, we have a Scanska tech tour uh, where, where we will be uh, looking at one of their projects, but I'll talk more on that later. And you also get, um, yeah, you also get eligibility for our job offers and merch. Uh, recently, we had uh, Simpson Strong Tie come in here and offer us a scholarship that yeah, people in this club would have been eligible for it. And we also have, in the past, we've also had many people give us internship opportunities and things like that. Um, as CCAP, uh, we highly encourage you to uh, sign up for CEOSC. CEOSC is the national version of our club. CCAP is just within our campus. And CEOSC is um, the national society um, that includes both professionals and students. Um, for students, the dues are free for two years. So again, we really encourage you to sign up. And we also um, make many events uh, catered to CEOS. Most recently, uh, we're promoting the Beirut um, talk tomorrow at 12 to 1. Uh, I know I've been pushing uh, many forms out about this. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. But I promise you that this is the last form that you have to sign if you're interested in this. Um, but yeah, in the chat, a Beirut form should be um, filling out. Even if you filled out a form in the past, go ahead and fill out this one. Um, we're making the admission $2 right now. Um, that should be a great discount uh, even for the group price because um, I was able to talk to some of the uh, CIOS members. And yeah, what will happen is I will stream it tomorrow uh, for those who signed up. I'll email you guys a link and um, yeah, we'll be able to uh, watch this talk. All right, tech tour opportunity. Um, I talked about this uh, a little bit earlier, but we have a tech tour opportunity with Skanska. Uh, they're gonna let us tour um, their L300 project in Washington. Um, this tech tour is completely free and virtual. So if you're available, um, we encourage you to sign up once again. Um, the uh, sheet will be going in, or the form will be going in the chat, just like always. And with any of these events, um, if you have any questions, go ahead um, and ask me at ccap.prez uh, at gmail.com. All right, uh, I'd like to pass the mic off to Tram to talk about our upcoming social. Hi hey everyone, so we have uh, an upcoming social on Thursday, next Thursday, not this Thursday. And we're gonna do a game night against Kayap. So you guys should come out to represent our club. And we're gonna play, I think three or four games for an hour. And it's at 8.30 to 9.30. So hopefully everyone will be out of class by then. Yeah, thank you, Tran. Um, yeah, really encourage you guys to come out to that as well. All right. Um, okay, so we're heading towards, we're about at the halfway point of this semester, which means we only have, um, I think three to four meetings left. And so I really wanted to talk to you guys about um, upcoming elections. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to let you guys know that by next meeting, which isn't March 30th, but we'll have it ready by then, um, we will be accepting signups for these positions, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, event coordinator, e-council rep, and webmaster. Um, and yeah, so if you're interested um, in uh, being part of the board of this club, um, just look out for signups. Those should be coming out real soon. Um, 
And yeah, this will be expanded on more next meeting. But what you'll need to do is sign up, uh, give a small speech at one of our meetings, and uh, you'll be voted in. And or we'll make a voting process and we'll see what happens from there. So yeah, if you have any questions on this, again, ccap.prez um, at gmail.com. All right, and make sure to follow our social media. Um, if you really wanna be involved in our club, a lot of our social media platforms, uh, yeah, it's a good way to stay connected with what we do. And uh, yeah, just be reminded of all the events. I know I dump a lot of announcements on you guys every time we have a meeting. So um yeah facebook instagram um both just at ccap very simple and i know i've said my email like a million times within this talk already so yeah um other than that i'd like to pass the mic to jazz to yeah, introduce our speaker uh good afternoon everyone uh, my name is jazz Jaslyn, and I'm your vice president for CCAP. And today we have our guest speaker, Alan Dick. He is a representative from Stantec. Take it away, Alan. Sure. Thanks, Jazz. Let's see. Make sure I get everything that thing worked fine before. So technology always likes to uh, screw up as soon as you actually need it to happen. Y'all see what I've got showing? All right. Excellent. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alan Dick. I'm a structural engineer. I was in California. Actually, now I'm in Denver. I just recently moved this year. Uh, pandemic portion uh, pushed. Uh, but uh, I still run all of our operations in California um, for, for, for structural. Um, Stantec is architectural and engineering and every engineer you can possibly think of, and we'll get into that a little bit further on. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Kansas City. Uh, I went to K-State as an architectural engineer, so that's why I have a T-square in my background. Uh, my family owns some, uh, a farm out in the middle of Kansas. I uh, don't really do any farming, but we go out and clear brush every so often. So I uh, enjoy to get to run the chainsaw every so often. Uh, while I was out in California, uh, I love rock climbing and hiking and getting outdoors, uh, especially sailing. Uh, I miss sailing now, but uh, better rock climbing, in my opinion, a little bit uh, more uh, higher up. So it's more strenuous, a more difficult, uh, but a lot of fun. So um, real quick agenda, just going to talk about Stantec in general. Um, then going to talk about case study for uh, Void Slabs, just talking about a project, uh, and then uh, hopefully a lot of time for discussion and questions. Anyone has questions about you know, career advice, classes to take, uh, opportunities at Stantec, opportunities um, elsewhere, where, what you should be focused on, uh, happy to talk about that. Uh, and also I get my email, so if you want to, you can contact me afterwards. Always respond to everything that comes in my way, um, and always have to, happy to help out students and, and new engineers. Um, Oh, one last thing I forgot to mention, I am licensed, both California PE and SE, but most of uh, US West, uh, which we consider Colorado to Hawaii. Um, so what you see on here is our global presence. Uh, Stantec is a big company, it's 22,000 people, uh, not quite as huge as AACOM, with 150,000 people or whatever, whatever they have now, um, but it's more large. And I always get questions, how does it feel like working for such, such a large company? My answer is it doesn't feel like that. Um, it feels like I work for a small company with a big background. Um, so here you see we have offices across the world. We just recently added uh, more offices in the UK. Uh, all of the dots down there in Australia are all fairly new, um, mostly structural engineering. Um, although we do quite a bit of, I think our most latest acquisition was environmental, uh, which is a wink. And I think they're from Amsterdam, um, different things. So as you get down to a smaller footprint, here's our offices in California. Um, we're all up and down the coast. Um, we have some stuff that's a little bit further inland. Uh, we used to have offices in Fresno, but I think we're, it was up. I think they decided to sell those off in the last year, the year before. But still, we have a lot of locations. Not every location is engineering or buildings engineering even. There's a lot of environmental, a lot of civil, uh, which, which, which we call community development. Um, there's some architecture. There's a lot of what we call the water group and power and dams. Um, I'm probably missing a three or four different business lines that we have, but all of those incorporate engineering and we do a lot of work together integratedly. Um, so it's something that the water group might do as like a water treatment plant also has a building associated with it and we'll come in and do the building. Sometimes we have a building we need to be on a brown site when we bring in our civil engineers and our environmental engineers all to help out uh, deliver a final product to the company, uh, to the end client. Um, we went on a little bit further. Here's our offices that we have in our buildings group, uh, specifically engineering. So we have a main office in San Francisco, Sacramento, LA, and San Diego. 
we have a small presence in Irvine. Um, and we have a few people out in San Luis Obispo. Um, most of those are AVP engineers and architects. Our, our structural practice is actually being built ground up from about four years ago. Uh, I joined three years ago uh, to build that same presence in LA. Uh, we're now up to nine engineers uh, and really hitting our stride. I have a lot of work coming in, so we're looking to expand quite a bit this year. Um, we've already actually filled our intern positions this year, um, but we're always looking for new talent coming in that's graduating in the December timeframe or even next, next summer. We start to look about October. Um, and we look for all of our offices, and that's for all services. So if you're not interested in doing structural for some reason, <laughs> if you're here, I hope you are. But if not, if you also want to dabble in, say, MEP or you're not quite sure, uh, we do uh, offer internships across the board. Um, you will get a chance to work with all engineering and all architecture that we have. In, uh, all architecture being interiors, uh, main building, uh, landscape. Uh, I'm sure they have a couple other things that they, they consider <laughs> unique and beneficial, but we, we focus mostly on we have architects and we have engineers. Um, we do a what we call it originally an internship design challenge and is now our internship program. Um, we interact with MEP engineers, structural engineers, and architects all across the U.S. and uh, Canada when they have a chance to participate. Um, since we're in a pandemic, it's easier to get across all of the different offices because we're all online running Zoom, so we're all more familiar with it. Uh, we do more work on an actual project from one of our offices. Last year, it was in Plano. Texas and it was for a Galveston client. So they worked on a wetlands out at the, um, along the Gulf Coast. They built a, or they designed a schematically a, it was a, um, oh man, that was a thing they did. Was, it was a visitor center, that's what it was. So they, it was a raise up off the ground because it has to be supported uh, for the surge you get from hurricanes. Um, a lot of fun, all, all interns really enjoy it. Um, the year before that was a project we used for a, a affordable housing in Sacramento. Um, again, working with all other engineers, all architects, creating a, a schematic design. You, you go through and you do the whole thing with calculations, creating drawings, creating visuals. You present to all of our principal leadership of, as well as our senior leadership up and down the, the chain and then also the external client. Um, external client really loves it because we get to see the awesome uh, designs that our interns come up with and they wonder what we can do. Um, usually our interns put us to shame. They do a really good job. So there's a, a lot of, to, to learn from, but it's also um, a really rewarding experience. Um, talking back to then about what we do rather than just where we are, here's all the sectors that our buildings engineering group works on. Uh, these are mostly what we use on, uh, focus on in the West Coast. We also do some sport. Um, I wanna say there's, uh, we have industrial on here. This is building, so we don't focus on water and infrastructure necessarily, but those are some things we help out with. Um, most of what we focus in on right now is a lot of industrial and transit in our LA office, healthcare in our Sacramento and San Francisco offices, uh, retail throughout the state, uh, multifamily and, and science and tech are both mostly out of San Francisco. And we have a lot of workplace and commercial that, and airport comes from outside uh, Denver and uh, Chicago are where most of those hubs are. And then they branch out and use the local resources to help support those projects. Uh, here's a good overview of all the different things we do. Um, Across the board, you have the general structural engineering and EP. Uh, we do a lot of lighting design, fire protection, uh, all the thing around sustainability to get tied with everything. Um, and our ICT group is a small burgeoning group that works across the US. Um, all services we provide to the clients and, and try to do as much integrated as possible. Sometimes they don't want everything for it, they think that's too risky, uh, but we try to push, they say it's, it's more beneficial to them because we're all working together so much. Um, that we know what each other needs are going to pr pr uh, propose for a system that we need to support, um, but also makes a, a faster communication and, and be much better uh, coordination. Uh, going a little bit further deeper now, then we've got into structural engineering, so very specific. Uh, here's some of the specialty things that we do. Um, you know, we've not all these things are done out of the same offices. We have experts all across the world. Uh, we have, for instance, we have fire engineering in Australia. Um, not quite sure exactly what that stands for, but I know that it has to do with, with uh, heat to structures and, and then designing things uh, so that you know, if one thing explodes or catches fire, it doesn't cause uh, undue harm to an adjacent structure or, or what, how would you figure out what the radius is to uh, like we just, uh, the next building. We used that recently on a, uh, it was a tank that was shown in a, on a hospital and they wanted to build residential across the street. Um, and there's government requirements for how close you can be to an un um, unprotected tank. It didn't have a masonry wall around it, but it was double walled. Um, we, we fought through with them to figure out how they can make that a development and still be safe to the people that were living there. 
Um, if that tank fails, it's not going to explode and cause a, you know, huge damage across the street and, and catch fire to people that are, you know, outside <laughs> walking around on the street, but they're, uh, they're safe. Uh, and, and, but proving that is in the next stage uh, of what that falls into. Um, off this on this, we do very basic stuff as well. They have general buildings, steel, uh, concrete, masonry, wood, timber, heavy, mem uh, heavy timber. We've done some rammed earth buildings, rammed concrete buildings. It's kind of anything you can come up with that's a material that you want to build from, we'll figure it out. Um, so I'm going to pause real quick and maybe take questions if there's anyone has any questions about Scantech in general before I jump into the case study. Yes, I have a question. Keep going. It's, sure, go for it. So did you say before, before that like uh, all the internship positions were already filled? For, for structures, they are. Yeah, unfortunately, we start searching about October, and we usually have our positions filled by December. Um, I know every university has a little bit different. We've been trying to hold open more positions later into the into the the, the, into the new year. Um, you know, San Luis Obispo almost doesn't start looking until February, um, so we're trying to balance that. And as we get larger, we're going to have more positions, so we'll have to be able to fill half with some early, half with some late. Um, and as we grow, we'll be able to expand that. But right now, that's what we have available. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. That's basically the gist of it. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 I always want to come in with the good news and, and be able to share. But um, that this year, we, we and we've been successful with the COVID back and forth. We had three interns last year. Both I, all the interviews were online. Never got a chance to meet them in person, uh, which I. I I don't enjoy. Uh, I much prefer to see everybody in place, you know, in person, and, and we'll be able to provide mentorship one on one. But um, we made technology work, saw saw each other, but didn't necessarily see you know, work each other next to each other in the office. I had a question. Um, I think it was under your, your areas of focus. What did uh, MEP mm -hmm. Engineering stand for? Yeah. Also oh, mechanical. Right? Sure. Yeah, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Uh, that's sort of oh, shorthand for. Yeah, that's sort of shorthand. I, I, we, we're bad about acronyms, especially here at Stantec. Um, but that's, that's an industry acronym that's, that's pretty bad as well. Um, some people will say MP&E or uh, everything. I've always heard MEP. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, your uh, infrastructure system inside the building. I see. Um, another follow-up question then would, uh, do you have, like, do you personally like uh, provide all these services like yourself or do you just rely on uh, your whole team as a whole? No, whole, whole, whole team. It's, it's far, far, too, uh, far too much to know uh, to be a, <laughs> a specialist in all this. So yeah, no. Um, when I was an uh, anarchy uh, grad, we learn all about all this. We have classes and just about all these things, um, but you focus in on one. Um, so I had some architecture classes. I had structural, I had MEP. I did have a lighting class and acoustics, went through civil classes. Uh, I think you guys probably have a good broad basis like that as well. Um, but we then focus in and, and spend more time. Uh, at the time it was a five-year program. Uh, now I think they're, they're pushed to a four-year, but they've, they've gotten rid of some of the some of the stuff that probably wasn't necessary that I had to go through. But, they, but the intent is then to um, you know know more about the building, know what the other people might be providing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you can see, read their drawings, read your drawings, and coordinate back and forth pretty well. I see. Thank you. Go ahead and move on. So uh, case study that we're going to talk about is a bubble deck void slab. Um, I, could, I like to folk highlight this project because it's uh, it's high in innovation, sustain, uh, sustainability, even though it's concrete. So I have a high carbon footprint, but less so than a traditional concrete building. Um, and then it's an alternative design method, alternative construction method. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how you get it to go through, get your innovations that you think are great and you want to push all this exciting stuff out into the, to the real world and you get a lot of pushback. Um, contractors especially, they want to do things the way they've always done them. They never want to do something new um, and they find reasons that are usually unreasonable for why they don't want to do it um, or, or become kind of preposterous or silly. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit when we get the constructability preaching. But the uh, design um, of this, so what, what we're talking about is it's a, a, a thick concrete slab that you have a, a, a void in the middle that's held in place. Um, basically, that you know, the concrete in the middle doesn't really do anything except add weight to your system. You, know, you need your concrete at the top for your compression. You need it to hold the steel to your, get your transfer and, and provide overall shear for the whole system. But generally, when you're out in the middle of a slab, you, you're doing with bending forces. You don't need that middle neutral axis area that has no force in it or no stress in it. You need all on the top and bottom on that perimeter. 
So instead, what we're trying to do is try to fill that with air, something much lighter. Um, and how, how to build that, how to construct that is, is uh, you know, difficult, but how to design it is also difficult because you're not just dumping it into RISA or in this case, ETABs or SAFE. Um, you, you need to provide some parameters. So there's some design considerations on the side. You get a reduction in weight. You get some reduction in stiffness and strength, but your trade-off is, is more weighted towards the weight. You're losing weight, so you're not having as much demand, but you're, you know, you're 10%, 8% uh, reduced in the stiffness. Um, Generally, you get a reduction in you know, 20%-ish, depending on what kind of slab you're looking at. Um, if you're a thin, something that's a foot thick, um, you're not getting as much. The higher you go, you're 16 inches, a 20-inch deck. For some reason, if you're, if you're at that range, um, then you're getting more, more savings. What's, what's that really doing is you can either reduce the overall weight of your structure or push out your spans between your, your columns uh, and your support points. So that, in this case, we were trying to push out you know, those spans to be maxed out having a very open footprint. In this case, it's a high red building in, in Pittsburgh. Um, you can do this in seismic you know, country out in California. Uh, it has been done. Uh, Harvey Mudd has a double deck project on their site. Um, I think there's at least one or two others that I know in uh, the high rise or high residential. Uh, I don't, there's in the Culver City area, I believe. Um, and then this has been done in Miami and New York and kind of up around. It's not widespread, um, but it is, somewhat prevalent, more so that you get, the more you get in, the more people feel comfortable with it. Uh, Kobiax is another system that's uh, more European based. Uh, I think although that is based in Canada, I believe. Um, but that's sort of what you run through on the design side. You have to make these assumptions. Okay, here's what we have, here's our loading um, and you know run through the system. So you make sure you're designing what you want. Then you have to take that design, you have to dump it out into a set of drawings so that the contractor and other people can look at it and understand what you need to get have done. You know, what you see on the left is something that looks like more a traditional um, type of drawing that you would see for a flat plate, um, you know, concrete running around what would normally be column drops around your columns for shear transfer. Um, if this was a PT slab, you'd be very thin concrete, uh, but very thick at the columns because you need that for your punching shear. Excuse me. Uh, but what we instead look at is you see all that's interior to the slab. So all this red hatch area is all the bubble deck that you see, all this, that's all void slab. Right at the columns, you have solid concrete, but then all the rest of the areas, you have all these little bubbles. Um, and bubbles is probably a bad term because they're, they're really just, they're, they're, there's plastic balls that go in the slab. Uh, contractors like to see bubbles and they go, oh, it's bubbles. Yeah, yeah. They make jokes and silly and it's about it. Well, you put bubbles on your concrete and you know, it's all hurts to do stuff you hear. But at the end of the day, it makes sense and it's actually, it's a viable way to go about it. So here you can kind of see this is what they mean. These are all fit within the slab. Um, but what you find, obviously, when you put it in a void into concrete when it's wet, is it wants to float because you've got a very liquid medium. Everything wants to come out of the slab. So what you have to do instead is pour the first level of concrete, let it set just a little bit so you get some anchors there at the bottom. And that's what these cages are, are around the bubbles. You kind of see that there. And there's a shear, it's some part of that shear transfer, but a lot of that just, this gets cast in, this bottom layer. These are two layers of bubbles. It's not one. Thing. So this is a three layers. Each one of these is one layer of bubbles that's going to go into your concrete slab. The bottom layer, there's a, a seal mat, and then there's a top seal mat. So this bottom mat gets held in the concrete. All that held it down so it doesn't float to the top. Uh, we did a project in uh, Texas for a, a stadium um, that we had a we had styrofoam. We were trying to we had these big cantilevers we were having to reduce. They, they had already poo pooed and said no, we're not doing bubbles. But we said well, you still need a void slab. So they said well, we'll do styrofoam. Okay, so here's what you need to do to make sure it's held down to your formwork. Uh, and lo and behold, they didn't do what we, we asked them to. Um, they didn't really do, test it out beforehand either. So their first major pour of this, uh, this, this void slab, they poured out and halfway through, while they're still pouring concrete, all the rebar is just coming out of, this, out of the concrete. Um, very, <laughs> I'm sure someone's stomach was uh, just dropping out of their, their, uh, out of their body going, oh my God, what's going on? They had to stop all pours, jackhammer all that out and redo the whole thing. Um, and they, they did a, they did a test a couple of times just to make sure they, they got it the next time. So eventually they listened to us, but it was very costly uh, when you don't listen to your engineers that tell you how you should build uh, something, something more unique, but otherwise it should be fairly simple. Um, we had a lot of problems with the contractor getting this sold. Once we got to the guys on the ground, they're like, yeah, yeah, we got it. No problem. But the guys up front, the estimators, they're just, they see all those risks. They don't, they don't, they don't see any of the benefits. They only see here's how it's going to screw up my project, which is viable. That's what their position is, but you kind of have to talk through them, all of these things. Um, one of them was, uh, you know, the height, you know, can I get my guys manhandle this? Can you get this in place? Here you see a whole bunch of pallets getting uh, your crane lifted down to the deck. 
Uh, and one guy, these couple guys was shifting around. Uh, what finally sold the contractor was selling and sold the client on it was they, we showed a video of some guys just carrying it around by their hand. And they're like, oh, this is really light stuff. Like, yeah, this isn't heavy. So there's always, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 why is it such a big deal? And the contract, well, I mean, oh, so they always back up once you get the client on your side. So it's one of those things. You have to, it's innovative. You have to convince the client. You have to convince the contractor that this is something that's not going to destroy their building. It's not going to be something that's detrimental to them in the long run. Uh, so next phase, next picture here is um, some coordination. So this is integrated, right? This is These are a bunch of conduit that's running in this lab. Um, where you see this line here, um, it was a, was at one point a going to be a row of bubbles. I told them they could take that out, put it on the conduit. We still get a void slab. Um, they had to hold it in a certain location that can't go as crazy as they might someplace else. Um, but the, at the end of the day, this allowed there to be less conduit underneath the slab. The architect wanted a very nice, clean looking cement uh, concrete uh, soffit with nothing in the way. Um, you still end up with some duct work uh, here and there, but for the most part, it was. Uh, it was very clean. You could see, you didn't see mechanical systems, you didn't see plumbing systems, co electrical conduit. Because um, at the same time, we also had a raised floor in a lot of areas, so all that stuff got pushed under under the floor between the, the slab and the where where you're walking. Um, but then there were still more systems that came through. Uh, lots of transferring. This was a big big footprint, um, so they had a lot going through. But there was still coordination that had to happen there. They can't go through you know these big areas that are your shear trans your your shear transfer at your punching shear problems at your column. So here we are. Rate, you know, cages, um, what we would totally typically use in California, which would be stud rails. Um, instead, you have a little shear cage because they didn't want to pay for stud rails. Instead, they wanted to pay a guy to do this, which is simply the same thing. It just wasn't a product. Um, they, they swore it was cheaper. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily buy that, but at the end of the day, this is, you know, so you just got to stay out of this area for, there's a, you know, we have one or two pump penetrations for some storm drains, but for the most part, this has to stay clear and open. Um, no, you know, no conduit was running through it. Um, no other, you know, little, there's little uh, hangers and stuff. You can see we call these blue bangers because they're blue and they bang them in the space, in the taste. Um, but there's a little insert to put in, um, I think lights. And this may have been also some rods that go in for uh, mechanical systems underneath. And you can see there's also then still another layer of re reinforcement that goes over. So this is this was what we would typically see top and bottom rat reinforcement at a two layer slab. Uh, I think this is a 14 inch deep slab. It might be a 13 um, that runs over top of the bubbles and between the bubbles. So you get that pushed down as low as you can uh, to minimize that total depth. Um, but you still want to have it, you know, inside some solid concrete. So you can't just run it over top of the bubble, touching the bubble because then you don't have any engagement in your reinforcement to your, um, to your concrete. Um, so the picture from the crane, in the middle of the first, their, this is their first section that they're putting together. Um, Fun thing about these, these are all plastic. Uh, they're usually a recycled material or a deferred uh, or a post-consumer product. In this case, it was kayaks that were rejected from Walmart, I think. Um, they, Walmart has consistent, you know, there's a, whatever criteria they have for what they will or won't sell in their stores. These didn't meet that criteria, so they were rejected. Instead of going to a landfill, we got to grind them up, remelt them back down into a plastic ball and, and, and put them into a building. Um, so deferring a lot of uh, waste that would have otherwise gone to a landfill. Um, at the same time, it's not really the greatest product in my mind as, a, as a, um, someone who buys into sustainability because it's plastic, it's oil-based, um, you know, it, it still generates a carbon footprint, but in this case, we took something that was already created, repurposed it, and, and stuck into a building that's going to last at least 50 years. It's on a university, so it should last a long time. They, they like to keep their, their infrastructure in place uh, forever. <laughs> so, the, and you see, see that there's uh, also the, the, you know, the, you get the column cap placements here as you see we're around shear walls we want to keep you know some good shear transfer um, and then they would continue through the rest of that formwork and that would kind of look the same um, the faculty for this building uh, was a business school got really into this project um, he got was a juggler he was on we have a video of him juggling some of these uh, while he's walking around on the deck um, they had a student uh, activity day where they brought business school students over they all got to sign a bubble and put it into the, into the concrete uh, slab um, I would have a picture of that, except there's some very inappropriate comments that some of the students got to, pay, to make. So we try not to push that out, but I'm sure everyone can imagine uh, you, have, you have all the opportunity to get what you want to on a ball that's going to be placed in concrete. No one's ever going to see it afterwards, but uh, you know it's there. So it's, it's fun because you get you kind of have some kind of tie into it. Um, so we try to work through with getting the client excited about stuff um, while you're pushing this new innovative. It's not a new and innovative, it's, it's new and innovative to the U.S., um, but it's it's 
it is a fairly innovative thing to do. I mean, we otherwise would have had a steel building because this was in Pittsburgh. Um, it would have been one story too tall. Um, it basically would have been 10 feet too tall over their prescribed uh, height limit. Uh, we told them to use concrete. We, we dropped off about 11 and a half feet off of the height of the building. Um, if they built it out of steel, they wouldn't have had four stories. They wouldn't have had three stories. Um, so we, we bought the client a lot of stuff with this. So there's a lot of other other things that really va provided value that, that pushed the client to this. We, but we all the way up until the end of SV, we carried steel and concrete for the contract at a price. Uh, they kept saying that steel was cheaper. Of course it was because they didn't take into account that their building was taller um, or that their finishes were had to go further. Um, there'd be more coordination with, you know, there's all these things that they didn't include uh, in their pricing that they just look at structure to structure, it's fine. But if you look at an integrated approach, uh, this came out uh, much better. Uh, and then you see here, this is them on pour day. Um, you get about that first level. This is that first level pour. You come up to about uh, maybe the eighth up the side of the bubble. Um, that's enough where it won't float off the of, off of concrete, but it won't, um, you know, it gets you enough bite for that bottom mat to catch into. So that when you pour the top layer, then the whole thing won't fly off. Um, you need about 12-ish hours between pours depending on the concrete mix, but it's about right. So they would pour really early in the morning, wait most of the day, and then pour really late at night, or they might pour mid-afternoon and then pour really on the morning the next day. Um, they try to keep it within a 24-hour cycle, so they keep just moving across this set. Um, one other thing that was interesting uh, as they got through all these um, is that they caused problems. <laughs> Once they get all this deck up, they had to pour, pour, pour the next columns up and all their next walls. To put those, you know, they brace all their floor mark that's in place um, to keep it from falling over in the wind events. Um, it's also Pittsburgh, you can see it's cloudy out, uh, it snows a lot, it gets very cold for long periods of time. Um, we had told them to provide dead weight, dead man anchors, which are just a big block of concrete you set off to the side so that when your brace comes into it, it doesn't move. They instead decided they wanted to punch uh, uh, holes into the concrete deck and, and do anchors that way instead. And lo and behold, we told them, we said, don't, don't do that. To make sure if you do that, don't puncture a ball. And if you puncture a ball, don't let there be sending water sitting on the deck. Uh, well, they did all those things. Uh, and so they allowed the balls to get filled with water. And then they had a weekend where it got, I don't think it got above 16 degrees. Uh, and they had all these problems on site. And there's all this spalled concrete. Well, why is the concrete spalling? Is the, the bubbles are expanding because it's hot or da 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 da? Well, no, you guys let them fold water. Water doesn't just condense when it gets colder, it expands, right? Ice is, it expands out. So they had all these, all the across the deck, right? All these little spalls. Some of them are on the top of the deck, some of them are on the bottom of the deck. Um, this is a big, big problem for lots of reasons. Uh, structurally, you can't have this happen. Uh, architecturally, this whole bottom slab is all meant to be exposed to. The class, you know, the students, the faculty, anyone walking through the building, they want to see this nice, what would be a clean deck uh, once it gets kind of polished off, uh, polished up, and you know, have all these, you know, you kind of get that a little bit um, nicer than what they have, but they, they don't have, you know, this is no matter what you patch it with, it's going to stand out. Um, and they, they found a way that kind of made they would take out an entire panel of concrete and then report it. Um, they actually had to patch it back up because it was above. Sometimes they had to drill a hole and, and, and uh, fill concrete down below. Um, they claimed that this was a major issue from the bubble deck and we told them it was a problem that we told them about several times. Um, at the end of the day, we managed to get a, a fix for them. It looked reasonably well in most of the locations. Um, some places they had to do quite a bit more demolition to get something that the architect would buy off on. Um, but it's a key thing, again, getting that buy off. Um, from the contractor, understanding what it is that you're trying to tell them to avoid, um, having them take some ownership of it. They, they, they saw this, as, they didn't get this problem until they had one full floor poured. Uh, the total project is about 300,000 square feet. So one floor, is about 50,000 square feet, maybe 100, uh, 150 feet from what we finally finished off of. I think it was a 500,000 square foot building, but it was, it was a lot to say that. And they had one full one all the way done. And then they just, they had this problem throughout the whole first floor. So one place where they couldn't have this problem, they really had the biggest problem. Um, and after that, from that, from then on, they were much more they were much more diligent about not having that, that happen. Uh, but it is something that uh, you kind of face um, dealing with contractors that just want to fly and, and move on. Um, but they're also under a lot of you know schedule constraints, so you try not to hammer them too much. But do what you do. Um, 
that's kind of it from the, this case study. Uh, taking away questions that even one has, I'm sure there's plenty about what Bubble Dick is or maybe Voice Labs. Anything that you saw that I can expand upon? Everyone, everyone can go design a bubble slab, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to ask, um, I see like in the concrete here and there's like uh, the dried portion and there's a darker portion. Is the darker portion from the wet, from the bubble? So, some, it, it, not from the bubble. Um, sometimes concrete's funny. Um, you get all sorts of different things that can show up that can be very problematic or they can be nothing. Um, in this case, it's, it's kind of nothing. Um, this is this concrete still a little bit wet from uh, water getting through water intrusion. Um, sometimes it's it, I think some of these panels like this is probably more of a water intrusion problem. Something that's just you're not going to face once the building's sealed up and enclosed. Um, mm -hmm. But while it's open to the elements, you're going to have still sitting on it. Um, I think this one actually some of these are actually what you're seeing is the type of it, it, it takes some of the shadowing from the whatever panel work you have underneath it. Um, I think if you see back in the first couple of pages, like not all of these are different, you know, some of these are different colors even, and oh, the concrete will pick that up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and even, even the style of what type of panel you use, these are all, I think, fiberboard, fiberglass of some sort. Sometimes they use plywood. Um, you'll see the, the pattern of the plywood on the underside. Uh, I've gone into some older, older buildings in the 1930s and 1920s that have, you can see the, the wood grain from the. Uh, these two buys to do all the form work and you can see all the wood grain from every single one all across the oh, way. Nice. It's, kind of, it's fascinating in a structural way, but um, <laughs> most most non-building nerds will uh, think you're kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then what about the one, the, the darker portion inside the hole, or not not the hole, but I mean the, ah, where the bubble is. Yeah, the, this spall here. Yeah, this, this is water coming. So the, the bubble, this bubble got full of water as it melted or as water above got through now you just have a nice clean hole through and that was they definitely had uh like you know puddling all through that that's all oh, wet okay. that's just this is water from above one other thing that can you kind of can see from this picture is you do see a little bit of shadowing down the lines mm -hmm. and that, that is like that is a little bit of a rebar shadow um once this concrete cures through in a full mm -hmm. month and or longer a lot of that cures out um when you first pull form work uh, a lot of times um, we've heard of, we, we had heard before we pushed this uh, from uh, our case study to make sure we were doing something that was right for the client. Um, from other people who had done this pro this type of product, um, that they pulled full work and their client just exploded. They couldn't believe that they had all these shadows everywhere and all their concrete. <laughs> well, you wait a week and it's all gone. It, it cures out, as they say. Um, but when you first see it, it is, it's, it's just a spot where this is, there's a rebar that's fairly close to that surface. It's not so close that it's, you know, outside of your tolerance of what you want for your design. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to be careful of it. You could get something like that uh, that is uh, showing that, or you could end up with a with voids. I've had projects where um, it was a wall instead of a, a, a floor, um, and it was a shot creep. Uh, but you, you pulled the former coffee, it was a retaining wall, so it wasn't too big a deal. But you could see every single bar. You could see right where it was because where they, they're shooting, basically just concrete and a hose, and you're shooting it at a wall. And it, it sticks, and they, they just build it up in layers. But you, but wherever there's a bar, you're only shooting from one side. So you never see, you don't really get concrete from the backside, and you're trying to kind of push it and fill it in. You're hoping that that mm -hmm. fluid really flows into that space, um, but it doesn't, it's not 100% great. Um, so it, it's, it's, it, there's a finish problem there, but that is, again, that was a retaining wall. It was covered up, you weren't gonna see it. In this case, yeah, this is gonna, this, this cured out, and you didn't, you didn't see that throughout. Oh, okay. Um... I see. Thank you. Sure, no problem. You got a question. Fasten, I'll look fast anything. It's fine. Yep, sure, go for it. Uh, if you're doing some uh, new building technology or designing something new for the first time, I'm sure you might mm -hmm. collaborate with uh, people that have done it before within the company. But if that's not an option, are you trying to find like case studies online or uh, other people that uh, do this in other companies that you can reach out to? How do you, how do you, get to the point to where you feel comfortable submitting your designs. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, you, at the end of the day, you have to make a judgment call, but you do gather as much as you possibly can. You find case studies. In this case, um, it's a product. So we work through with the, um, the manufacturer that pushes this. They have their salesmen. Um, you know, you, you had, um, I'm sure you've all either been through a Simpson seminar or a Hilti seminar, but it's a similar kind of rep. 
Um, they have a little bit of an engineering background. Sometimes they're more salesmen than they are engineer. Um, so you have to take everything they, they say with a grain of salt. Um, so we, we, we take and what they have and then get their case studies. Um, in this case, we talked with uh, Matt Construction in LA. Um, they had done the Harvey Mudd College um, product that I project that I had just mentioned earlier. Um, and they gave us, here's what, here's how we approached it. Here's the pitfalls we faced. Um, they did a filigree panel, which is they basically, they, did, they precast that first layer and then they lifted a whole panel as one and placed it in. So it was more like a concrete, uh, a precast concrete slab they placed in and they poured their, their top, um, their second pour on top. Um, you didn't put a little ridges down the line so you wouldn't get quite the clean look that we we're looking for here. Um, so we didn't go that route or we, we convinced the contractor they shouldn't go that route. They also agreed it, didn't, it wouldn't play out in the way that they would need it to for their schedule. Um, but we also worked through with them about what NEP coordination we need to do. Uh, the client was very concerned about having to come in and you know, with a PT deck, you're, you're limited to how deep you can come in because you don't want to hit a tendon or you have to scan so you don't hit a tendon. Um, same thing, you don't want to hit any bars, but this was going to be high enough up that you weren't going to, you could attach shot pins, um, you could do post assault anchors that, weren't, that could get the value you need to support what they were looking for. Um, They're also worried about if you, if you drill through for a new bathroom. Um, so we need to worry about popping a ball. Does the ball blow up? You know, no, you just drill through it. It's actually a shorter drill. So you don't have to go through and you hit the void. Then you can either go through the void and keep drilling to the bottom or you can come up to the bottom and go the other direction. Um, I also talked through with them about how the systems that go through, so the conduit, you know, how would that go through? How, you know, what can you do? What have you, you know, what the, con the bubble that guy's like, oh, you can do anything you want. Oh, it's all great. You, everything works. You talk to the Matt construction, they're like, well, this we could do, we kind of could do like three or four at a time in the rows. So you can see, I think maybe, you know, a little bit. There's some of these are kind of where they're running all along and then they hit this junction box. Um, they're in the line of the bubble. Some of them were, they're running down the little space in between. Let's go the other direction. You know, some, there's some of them you could fit some of the, the conduit right through here, or you had to take out a whole section of, of balls and do that, that bundle. All right, so here we did a bundle. Other places they did, uh, you know, a single a single conduit could run along the line of the bubbles. Uh, so we got some of those ideas um, from the Mac construction. It also changed how we detailed. Uh, we provided additional details for coordination. Here's what you can do for this kind of situation, etc. And, and the contractor at one point was very worried about being able to get these balls out of the cage. Like, well, you can come in and just clip them, or you know, if you can see this, they, 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 they punctured them a little bit. You know, it's, it's crumpled. Uh, they could actually punch that out and pull it out uh, as a single unit. Um, those side sort of issues where, uh, well, what, then what do you do with them? Well, then you put them back into a bin and you ship them back to us and we reuse them and we send them back to you as another product. So you don't, these aren't waste. They're, they're actually sent back to Bubble Deck and they're put back either back into another cage or they're used as a, a fill in someplace else. Um, but they were worried about even, you know, the collection of these all over the place. Uh, and they found their, their workers uh, shooting them as hoops more often than not and, and having too much fun on the deck. So they had, had some safety moments uh, every so often, but yeah, that's, those are the kinds of things we, we learned and we, we use up, but we also, um, you know, those are due diligence. Okay, hey, can we, can we do this um, fundamentally from construction? We got construction. We also talked to some other engineers that had done the design. Um, they would given us some sample detailing. Um, I don't have details here, but there's some of the sample detailing is from a, another engineer. Um, they, they were gracious enough to offer their details to us. Like, hey, here's, here's, what we, here's what we use. You know, we, we didn't copy it you know, verbatim, but we took that as the, the starting point built our details based off of that. Um, same thing with how the drawings went through. There's actually a, a separate engineer that generates. So this is this is actually our drawing. This is actually a, a shop drawing coming back to us. And you can see our shop stamp there. Um, but the, this was, they, they're laying out, you know, what size of panel do they use? You know, this comes in, a, in a, off the truck in a certain, a couple of different sizes. So this is them picking out those different sizes. They, you know, they manufacture 200 of this size. You know, there's a bunch of little infills so that are you know these little blue ones and there's a little green one so all those are different pieces that they built uh on before they went to the truck and you've got the four different sizes down here um so that that's that those kind of things learned us through the efficiency of how to how to make it efficient for the contractor uh, but also how to design it you know when we're coming back here how do we lay this out how should we tackle the, the analysis um you know where are we going to find problems um and at the end of the day, we, we did enough that we got through it pretty pretty well and scathed, uh, you know, con contractor aside. <laughs>
Well, I hope that answered what you're looking for. We, 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 de we you definitely want to talk to other engineers, contractors, especially, because they're the ones that are going to hate. They're the ones that really see what's kind of the BS and what's the real reality in the situation. Like, yeah, these guys sold us this. We had to do this to make that actually happen. So you can kind of get that now at the front. Uh, you, your lessons learned from somebody else. Um, and for the most part, they're usually pretty happy to help out. Um, uh, also because we were doing other projects with them. So that, that also benefited us with that construction. Um, but at the end of the day, for a community of, of engineers, we should be helping each other out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure, no problem. Sorry, you might have already covered this. What was the purpose of the balls that you put? Sure. Yep. So that's that's the void. That's the void. We're getting to to the talk about the the section here. So you really you end up with your neutral axis right in the middle. There's not really much stress there, right? You don't need all this concrete. It's all it is is just dead weight. It's not giving you any benefit. Um, at the shear when your shear controls, it adds, it does add benefit. Um, and you do get a little bit of reduction um, to your stiffness overall. So your deflection still is a concern. Um, you might not be able to go as far as you would if you had 100% of your you know, stiffness of your, of your total section, um, but you lose so much dead weight off of the system um, that you, overall you get a benefit. Instead of a deck that is 150 PS PCF for your concrete, you can multiply well consumption that's 120. Um, you know, we, we, we designed the slab as a 12, 13 inch, I think 13 or 14 inch slab but with a lower density without using lightweight concrete. Um, it's, you know, if you design this full section at 14 inches, it wouldn't work. Um, you'd have to go to 15 or 16 inches. So we are saving, overall we are saving depth by doing that, but really just saving that dead weight. Um, it doesn't add to your capacity by a significant margin. You can pull it out. Um, there's a trade-off. If you're a 10 inch deck, you wouldn't be able to take out that much. Um, but if you're at a 20 inch deck, you can take out a whole amount, a huge amount. Um, so it scales as you get deeper. Um, we were right in the cutoff point. We we're we we're probably about where you need to be, 13 and more inches for total deck depth to make it work economically. Oh, that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Sure. I'll go up for QA since we're in that. Um, what you see on the screen is our our, uh, our values for our company. Um, a little more about Santec. We always, we we do um, hold ourselves to what we think is a higher um, you know responsibility to ourselves to the community. Um, you know, we, we operate in a very ethical manner, um, and we really like to uh, get things done. Um, so you take that for what you will. But um, all all questions open. Um, ask what you will. Or everyone's reading. <laughs> well, I can ask the question if, or go. No, sorry, go ahead, um, so in regards to internships, I know there's like certain level of requirements for those internships. Mm -hmm. Like the first one would be like, would you have like intensive like exams first before being like a pre-qualification? Like, do we have to like mm -hmm. take an exam to pass a certain score and then get an interview? Because I know there's some no, that we, do that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know like, they can call my note. Does a big long one like that. Um, um, a couple of hours. We 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 have like a little quiz, like three or four questions, just to get your idea about here. How do you handle problems in the doing problem solving? Um, we're hoping that you have a good background and based on you're going to a great college. Um, um, it's part of the interview part process. Of the process. We don't do a pre-qualification pre before that. that. What we, we do need is have to be about finish your junior year. year. We, we want to have at least some design, design classes. classes. Um, um, you can, you can, I'm getting all feedback, feedback in my head. head. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Appreciate it. I think there's an echo there's on, your on your end. There you go. Thanks. It's, it's so hard to try and fight through that. Um, no, we, we, we want at least a junior year because we want you to have some design classes in, in hand, steel, concrete, something along those lines. Um, it allows you to get more from your internship. Um, we, sometimes we get uh, resumes from freshmen and sophomores. We don't necessarily can't use them, but they're, gonna, they're not going to have as much 
gained out of that internship as if you're a junior. We highly prefer uh, undergrads. Uh, you finish your undergrad before you're a graduate. Um, we do require from our structural group uh, that you have a master's program if we're going to hire you full time. Um, but we try we we stress that in our internship and we show you why um, that that's a requirement that we have as far, at least in California. Um, West Coast is a big deal for us for seismic design. Um, we want to make sure there's a robustness to your education, and, and sometimes that four-year degree doesn't quite get you uh, as deep as you want to be. Um, you need to be. Um, there's just that, an extra layer that you get in that graduate program. Um, but we want at least a junior year. That, that's our. That's probably that's really our only prerequisite. Oh, I have a question about that. I know we have a mm -hmm. few minutes left, but since we're talking about sure. like uh, in, in internships and all, like. Uh, so you said junior year is the ideal year and you mentioned also design courses would help. Do you have any like specific design courses like that you could think of that you think may be helpful for like for someone like looking for an internship with like structural engineering? Is there sure. Yeah, you should definitely, definitely have a concrete design class and it's, ideally you have a concrete and steel design class yeah. uh, done another way. If you have one or the other, that, that's perfectly fine too. Um, we have plenty of interns that come through. They've had steel design, but not concrete design. Uh, it doesn't preclude you from being able to do it, but it just that you don't have, the, we had to teach you a little bit more in, in the internship. Um, yes, I, to that I, I point. understand, that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand, yeah, ideally, it's... like, the candidates, you, ideally, you'd want the candidates where you have to, like, invest less time into, te into teaching them the concepts and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we also don't want to just dump you onto shop drawings either. Um, I know some places, they have interns that only, you're doing shop drawings for the whole summer. Um, that's not to us very rewarding for you, um, and it doesn't. Yeah. It, it's cheap and easy for us, but it, I, I don't. Um, it doesn't give us the insight we we want because we we want you to have an internship with us, and then we want to hire you full time. So we want to train you in that that summer, but we also want to get a sense. You know, what's your design skill? Can you do what we want you to do? Um, but exactly. then they were. That, it's as much on us as it's on you because it's on us to train you and give you the, the opportunities. Yeah, that's why I was asking that. I'm taking steel design this semester, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, and, uh, also for like the for candidates. Oh, for the internships, are they just summer or are they go, or do they go all year round? They, they can be all year round. The, our our full time that we generally push for is on the summer. Um, we have had co ops, um, so you start in the summer. We actually have a, a part time student from USC that uh, he's he <laughs> started in Sacramento and he's been going to USC, so he's worked in our LA office. Uh, part time while he's been going to class, uh, more so since we're in pandemic, he doesn't have to go into class. He's working all remote. Um, but we, 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 given our workload, we can do that. We, we don't necessarily advertise that very straight up because there's not very many programs we find uh, that are conducive to it. Um, but if we find the right candidate and someone who wants to pursue that, we're we're more than open to that. Yeah, and, uh, and I should say that, sorry, I do want to say well, the internships we have uh, filled in are California. If you're interested in going someplace else in the U.S., uh, I would suggest going to our website, uh, punching in Santa, you know, we have a job search uh, function and seeing if any of our other offices are, are looking for interns. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and also one, la one last thing. So for mm -hmm. the, for the, when you hire interns, though, do you pref is, it like, is it preferred that they're really close to graduating? like and, and have like less classes to take though is it is that a, like a preferred like qualification no, not 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 necessarily um the more classes you have taken the the we, we try to tailor it based on you know the applicants we receive sometimes we receive mostly juniors and, and no undergrads um other, you know, other times we, we don't but that last year of school is um you know it's nice to have but it's not a requirement um, and we don't put one over the other. We we generally go with who we think is the best candidate uh, for long term. Uh, we don't try to think short term. Okay, this is a student that's going to be able to design stuff better than the other one. You know, quicker. Um, we'll, we'll actually look for more uh, cultural fit than anything. That's why I was asking though, because you know it's possible. Like mm -hmm. if, if you pick a candidate who's really close to graduating, if it's possible you may think like, okay, we can if we invest a lot in this candidate. We can hire them once they graduate. And, you know stuff like that that's why i was asking yeah. about it no we, we try to push even for for that i i don't i like having that junior year because then we can bring you back again for another internship the next summer um before you know you're you know so then you really know what we're doing um and that's actually gives us a benefit of, of two times of you know two passes at training essentially through the summer um before we would hire you as a full hire um you know full-time uh, engineer so th that that's that's i wouldn't consider that a, a detriment by by going in as a junior 
All right. Well, I, I feel like I had more questions, but we're out of time. So, yeah. Okay. Well, if you have more, absolutely. Um, please do, um, you know, email me. Um, everyone, I'll share this uh, slide deck with everyone too. So with Jazz, so you can send it out to everybody. Um, uh -huh. More than happy to allow that to um, go take, take additional questions. Um, if you didn't get a chance to ask one, you want to ask one, um, I, I do everything I can to respond to every email that I get. Um, Ellen, it, it, do you mind staying back for like maybe another five to 10 minutes or did you sure. have to go to another meeting? Yeah, because I'm going to actually- go, uh, Five more. Five, five more minutes? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I'm going to um, take charge of the, the Zoom because um, they all have, some, okay. most have to leave because they have class at one. But um, sure. this is actually one of my top three companies that I actually wanted to work for. So like, I have some questions too. So like, uh, if, if anybody else want to ask their questions first, because like, it's going to be a yeah, lot. I just had one little baby question actually. So how hard would you say, or how much would you say your uh, international branches, particularly your ones in the UK are looking for employees? They are constantly, I know that they've given us multiple rounds of hey we you know if anyone wants to second or, or transfer um you know that we're, there's there is potential for movement um we haven't had any takers that have wanted to go most before we get or if we want to come from the uk to the us um but we we do have opportunities for that from time to time i don't know how often they are but i know we have at least three or four requisitions currently open for anyone who wants to transfer within the company okay now do you know where those offices are in the uk I don't off the top of my head. I know they have at least twelve locations. So I mean, you can pretty much pick a spot oh, wow. in the UK, and that's probably an okay. office there. Yeah, it was a pretty large company. Okay, they, cool. P P. I can't remember if that was no, that was PBA was a what that was the Australian one. No, so PBA. I was uh, Peter Bartlett Associates was what formerly, and now they're Stantec. So that's the that's the company. If you want to look up there, or you can look at Stantec, you can see if we have a list of all our offices there too, on the website. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna ask uh, some questions like pertaining to like that master's degree. So like, I know mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a master's, but I was planning to get a master's in business because I was thinking of going into management. However, mm -hmm. would that be like okay with the company or do you have to take like structural engineering for your master's program? Because I'm like still deciding. Yeah, you, you, you do. Uh, we, we, what the master we're looking for is is technical, is, is in structural engineering. Uh, we're not, we're not oh, going to okay. turn down an MBA also. I mean, that that's that's still a huge benefit. Uh, but to do, in, we're going to focus first on engineering and then management is what, where you probably will track through. If you want to do uh, management, though, I, I would have to see, and, and less engineering, we could look at um, management, our management track, and that's a little bit different, uh, a different track to go into. And you guys do, do have, have that, that you, you do have that available as well. Okay, I'll probably email you mm -hmm. more about that as well. And um, sure. there's some challenges as um, for like maybe like second or third year, let's just say we don't have like a lot of experience with like using like AutoCAD Super 3D or like um, like certain programs, like you guys use Civil 3D, right? Or do you guys use like we, um, like a Revit variety? For Revit, oh yeah, I have Revit too. Yeah. So like you guys mostly use Revit though for your mm -hmm. um, projects. Okay, well, that's good to yep. know. Because um, in, in, in our intern, we train everyone that comes in. We, we, it's nice to have if you have some Revit background, um, but usually our first two weeks, we're, we're dumping you into um, a, a kind of a Revit bootcamp with our BIM leads. Um, and they, they take you through how to, how, to, how to model, how to do all the things you need to do in Revit. Uh, but we also usually have some typical details or some kind of drafting effort that needs to be picked up. Uh, and we use that as sort of a trainer course uh, it's not going to be doing the whole time being a drafter, um, but it's going to be something that helps you get into the program and learn some of the, you know, navigating and feel uncomfortable with it. Okay. And you said October is the next um, recruitment for um, STEM yeah, yeah, for, for the structural group, our, the, my, I, I try to push them into, into October because that's usually when we start to see a lot of candidates start to look um, from, from other universities and we try to pull from a kind of a, a wide variety. Um, that's basically usually in October is about when we've opened up a position and we're looking to, to pick up. But if oh, you okay. want to get in on that, I, I, if someone emails me and I, I, I'm telling them to look for it, I'll, I will email back out, hey, we posted the position, you should go take a look at it. 
And are you now currently just Denver location? Or are you also in the California as well for uh, Stanford? I, I, I'm in Denver, but I'm restaurant, I'm still looking and hiring and managing the, the California practice. So I'm, I'm currently covering all of US West, um, which is really on me in Denver and then everybody in California. Um, but we're looking to expand out. Eventually we want to be in Portland in a significant manner, Seattle um, and Denver and, and Phoenix. Okay. Thank you. I think that's uh, the answer to most of my questions. I'll send you an email in more depth of, um, of course. the other requirements. Anybody else have any last questions before Ellen um, uh, leaves? I just have a quick question. So in the hiring process, what if you're currently taking like a steel class, like it's October, that semester, it's fall semester, you're taking perhaps like reinforced concrete or steel in that moment. And then the next semester, you're going to take either or that's for the internship that's, over the summer is that like considered okay yeah that's perfect that that's that, that's the exact time because you, you're going to just finish the class before you start the internship you don't need it before you apply okay way. okay sounds good that, yeah. just to clarify thank you sure no problem i don't know if there's time for one more question but i don't oh the yeah, last one last one okay so yeah what was basically i was going to ask i know you said like ideally like june june juniors like it's a it's a good year to start off internship but is it also possible to for uh for Stantec to take them on like if they just if they just graduated college as well is that also possible yeah i mean we, yeah and we our internships just after you finish your undergrad and before going into grad school we'll definitely do internships then as well yeah, okay, anything anything after the junior year mm -hmm. That's why I was just, I was just wondering, you know, hope, uh, if it's not too late, like if, even if like, like if you go through college and you don't, you didn't get any internships, but then like, but then, but then, but then you get one after you finish your undergrad degree. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, I would still go to the website even if you're not quite sure of what we have open because um, my, the structural buildings group, if you're more interested in say something along the water or infrastructure lines, I know they have internships as well. So there's other business groups within Santec that are also have structural engineers that they are have internship positions for. Um, so I always go to the website, absolutely, and it's a, as a minimum to check. We do, our, our posting for the summer is still up there for buildings, uh, and we still take on the resumes, and I still uh, get a chance to um, see those and, and um, then keep that in, you know, I've got you in the log essentially for next year. So I try to send out a, a, an email to everybody, you know, here, here's who um, we wanted to interview, but we didn't have a chance to because it was already filled. Um, we try to reach back out the next year if you're still open for it. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ellen, for your time. If anyone okay. else has any questions, just go ahead and email him. Um, his screen is still showing up there. You can screenshot it or write it down, and uh, he'll get back to you when he has uh, time. I'll also Absolutely. include it in the recap if anyone needs it. That'll be sent out in a few days. <laughs> thank you, Ellen, um, for your time. Thanks. We appreciate Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I love, I love talking to students too. So this has been fantastic. Yes, appreciate. we hope to have you again. <laughs> Absolutely. In the next Definitely. semester. Okay. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. You all too. Goodbye. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. <laughs>